All right, welcome to the video lecture for combined chapters 22 and 23. Um, we are largely going to be focusing on the death of stars. But before we do that, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Dr. McGovern, you're, you're talking about stars living for billions of years? You're talking about stellar birth happening in millions of years? How do we know that? We haven't been around millions or billions of years. How do we know that it takes that long for this stuff to take place? Well, it is a fair question, and I will retort with uh, uh, an analogy here. Do we have to study how a person ages by watching a single person? I go through the entire 80, 90, whatever, how long they live, years of their life to really understand how a person ages. You say, of course not. We can study examples of people at all different ages. Then we kind of piece together a picture of how a person ages. Well, guess what? That's how it's going to work for stars. We don't need to watch a star for a billion years to know how it's going to go through all of its different stages. We can look at stars at, um, at different points in their life, and then again, piece together a picture. So how do we do that? Well, the way we're going to do that is by studying stars that exist in groups. Those are called star clusters. Um, star clusters are really helpful for us because stars that are in a cluster, they all formed at the same time, so they have the same age. And because they're all grouped together, they're the same distance from the Earth. So any differences in their brightnesses must be luminosity differences, right? And, um, and actually, that is really helpful to actually know what the ages of these star clusters are. We're actually going to develop a technique here where we can know the age of stars uh, because they exist in a big group. So we're going to look at different examples of star clusters here and see what we can say about uh, about stars in those clusters. Now, a few things to keep in mind here. Well, the big thing to keep in mind is when we look at stars in a star cluster, we want to remember that massive stars just do everything faster. They're born uh, and their birth stages are faster. Their life is faster. Their death's going to be sooner than anything else, in, um, any other stars. So... Uh, keep that in mind when we look at this stuff. So let's look at some examples of star clusters. So here we got a great star cluster right here. Uh, this is NGC uh, 346. It's in the Small Magellanic Cloud. Uh, the Small Magellanic Cloud is a small, irregular galaxy that exists just outside of the Milky Way galaxy. It's something that can be seen in the Southern Hemisphere. And... Um, this particular object is an example of what is called an open cluster. So now, when you look at this picture here, you know, ask yourself this question. Do you think that this is a relatively old region of space or a young region of space? So think about that for a minute, just based on what you see in this image here. Well, hopefully you're properly identifying this as a relatively young region of space. Now, how do you know that? Well... There's a lot of blue color here. Now, blue color is something that is typically generated from the hottest, uh, most luminous stars. So um, those stars apparently exist in this cluster because they're producing all of this blue light. Um, and remember, they don't live very long, so that must mean that this particular region of space is pretty young if they're still alive, producing all this light. Uh, the other indication is the combination of emission nebula and dark nebula. The fact that this still looks like a nebula um, means that this is also relatively young. I would put the age on this region at something around 10 million years, which is pretty young for a region of space. And you see a big cluster of stars in here. Now, we call this an open cluster because... Uh, the currently the membership of the cluster is all clustered together, but it will not stay that way. Uh, there will not be enough gravitational potential energy here to hold all the stars in this cluster. They will eventually disperse away 
And after about 100 million years, there won't be a lot of visual evidence for the fact that star formation occurred in this region. You won't see a cluster of stars anymore. They're just going to move on their way and enjoy the rest of their uh, life on the main sequence. So uh, now we want to study clusters like these because we get to see how a lot of lower mass stars are being born. We can look at some of the higher mass stars on the main sequence, and we actually can see a lot of stars already dying. The most massive stars at this point, B stars, are starting to die. Uh, the O stars are probably gone at this point. This is truly 10 million years old. So we get kind of everything here, birth, life, and death uh, for an open cluster. Um, when we study this star cluster, again, if it's truly 10 million years old, then we have a good glimpse of stars at the 10 million year mark. Okay. All right, let's look at the next one here. This one's a globular cluster. Um, we have many globular clusters in our galaxy. This is one that's in our galaxy, around, like, around 200 or so, and they surround our galaxy in a giant halo. And uh, we'll talk a lot about globular clusters when we get into talking about the Milky Way galaxy because they play a very important role in determining the dimensions of our galaxy. Um, but you see the picture on the left here. Um, it's a very dense region of space. Lots and lots of stars all uh, uh, clumped together here. And as you might imagine, this is a relatively old region of space. Uh, globular clusters, it's not uncommon to see them over the 10 billion year mark. So that's a very, very old region of space. And when you look at the picture on the left there, you can kind of see why. Um, I mean, what are we looking at here? No nebula. Um, the colors are more sort of yellowish orange. You don't see a lot of blue color here, so all of those higher mass stars have gone. Um, if you look at the picture on the right, uh, what kind of things are we seeing there? Well, the most luminous objects in this picture are giant stars. They're actually probably stars very similar to the sun that uh, have just begun to die. And then we have these fainter red things. What do you think those are? All right, those are the so-called red dwarfs, or what I usually like to refer to as the lower main sequence stars, K stars, M stars, is what we're seeing there. And then you see where the arrows pointed to, really little tiny blue speck there. Those are white dwarfs. Now, because this region's so old, this is a really great um, region to study stars um, that are very old and so we're looking at the study in giants and studying low mass main sequence stars and studying some of the death of intermediate mass stars uh, that's the advantage of a cluster like this that's called a globular cluster because when these things formed uh they did stay together uh, there was enough mass and the stars are densely enough packed here that um the stars were not able to freely move on their own and when they form they stay as a big sort of glob. That's why we call globular cluster. And um, yeah, and they're, they're sort of just stuck together here for the rest of their lives. So anyway, um, if we want to know what the stars are like at sort of the oldest possible ages we can imagine, like 10 million years is pretty, uh, 10 billion is pretty far back. Um, so we have an example of what stars are like there. Um, <clears throat> All right, so obviously, if we're going to be studying stars in a star cluster, guess what? We're doing nature diagram stuff. Um, this picture you see here is an example of the Hades star cluster. Uh, the Hades star cluster is a sort of moderately aged star cluster. Um, I don't have a picture here, but if you see at the top, there's the name Hades star cluster. You can Google an image of this thing. Uh, the star cluster doesn't really show much nebula at all, but there is still blue objects there. So that doesn't put it as being extremely young or extremely old. So what we do is we have to look at these stars on the HR diagram and um, see what kind of things are present here. So this is what we've done. This is the objects in the Haiti star cluster placed on the HR diagram. And let's figure out what we're looking at here. There are no supergiants in the star cluster. There are no O stars. There are no B stars. There seems to be some A stars, and you'll notice that some of the A stars are sort of elevated on the main sequence, and we are starting to see a population of giant stars grow. 
In fact, what's happening here are the A stars are starting to die. And they are evolving off the main sequence and they are becoming giants. Their motion is usually up and to the right, sometimes more up, sometimes more right. These objects tend to go more right. That means they're cooling off as they're expanding in size. Uh, F stars, G stars, K stars, we see them on the main sequence here. There's no M stars or white dwarfs. You may be wondering why are there no M stars uh, or white dwarfs. There are M stars and white dwarfs, but this is what's called a magnitude limited sample. Uh, they just didn't spend enough time to look at those objects. It just wasn't part of the project that they were working on. Um, so to get this data. Uh, so what is of interest to us here in this cluster is a location called the turnoff point. And the turnoff point is a location on the main sequence where you do not see stars any further up the main sequence. So the turnoff point for this cluster <clears throat> are, is the A stars. Now, what's significant about this is because those stars are starting to become giants, that means this star cluster has an age that is equal to the life expectancy of the stars at the turnoff point. So if the turnoff point's at A stars, the question is, well, how long do A stars live for? Well, they live for about a half of a billion years. So this cluster is a half a billion years old. And now we can say that we're looking at objects that are at an age of half a billion years. Okay. And we can do this for other clusters and look for other turnoff points. In fact, here is an example of different turnoff points. I've actually selected uh, examples for different orders of magnitude in age. So the one at the top is a million years, and then we go 10 million, 100 million, all the way down to the 10 billion year mark. And um, <clears throat> you can see how the turnoff point is changing. It starts very far up on the main sequence. In fact, the top image is we are looking at O stars uh, at the turnoff point, and they start dying right away, like right at a million years. <clears throat> we see a bunch of super giants there. B stars have hit the main sequence. Looks like some of the other younger mass, uh, uh, sorry, uh, lower mass stars um, really haven't hit main sequence at all. Uh, then we go below, we see the 10 million year mark, uh, we're looking at B stars starting to die, it looks like some A stars have probably hit main sequence now. An object like our sun is uh, not finished with the birth stages yet, remember it takes about 30 million years for a star like our sun to go through its birth stages. Now we get a little further down, we're looking at 100 million years old. It's a little bit younger than the cluster we just looked at, turn off points starting to, to show up around A stars. We got a billion here, F stars are starting to die, 10 billion G stars are starting to die. So it's this really simple gauge of age. Um, we just, it's like a one-to-one -one correlation how high up the main sequence is a turnoff point, and the higher up, the younger it is, and the lower down the main sequence, the older it is. So, so what we do here is we just have to look at lots and lots and lots of star clusters and gather their information on a nature diagram and search for this turnoff point. And then we have examples of stars at tons and tons of different ages. And then we start to sort of look at a given mass, a given spectral type, and see how it evolves over time. And, uh, and that's how we are able to put the ages on stars. And that's how we're able to like study the evolution of an individual star, even though we don't watch it for its entire life. So that's sort of the usefulness of, uh, of studying these star clusters. All right, so that was just kind of an intermediate topic I wanted to get into uh, before we jump into the death of stars because it's something that's relevant to the life of stars. And at some point, I think it should be addressed. You know, it is sort of extraordinary that we're able to speak of these extremely long periods of time without actually experiencing them. So, all right, now we want to talk about the death of stars. Right? So we had a lot of really rich information about the birth of stars and we saw a bit about the life of stars and eh, it's not the most exciting thing um but something extraordinary uh that happens with stars is is, is when they die uh, they go through some pretty pretty significant changes and they, they tend to take on very sort of beautiful appearances i'll be honest with with uh with um a lot of these objects um sometimes well let's just look at what we have here uh 
we are going to primarily look at two main ways that stars die, all right? So what does it mean for a star to die? Well, what does it mean for a star to live? A star lives because of nuclear fusion reactions. So a star will die when those stop. Why would they stop? Because you just run out of fuel. There's only so much mass that a star has to perform fusion reactions, and at some point it runs out. Uh, and when it runs out, <clears throat> um, one of the two forces in hydrostatic equilibrium is going to win sort of the battle that's been taking place over the entire star's life. Gravity's trying to crush the star, and the gas pressure's trying to push the star outward, and one of those will win. And the picture on the right is an example of the gas pressure winning. So uh, what has happened, uh, the picture on the right is something known as a planetary nebula. And it is a star that is like the sun, um, and it has died. And the way it dies is by gradually shedding layers. And it keeps shedding layers until the inside of the star is revealed. And as you see in the picture there, that white star right in the middle is a brand new white dwarf. So the nebula itself is called a planetary nebula, and the core, what was the once core of the star, is now a white dwarf. <clears throat> Gas pressure one here. Uh, gravity uh, started to crush the star um, as it was running out of fuel, couldn't support itself, but it actually caused the interior to get significantly hot, uh, hot enough that the gas pressure was able to push back against gravity enough to make gravity uh, lose the battle here. Now, the picture on the left here is um, uh, what appears to be a very similar looking image. It's some kind of giant spherical nebula here. But this is an example of how a higher mass stars die and higher mass stars, uh, gravity wins in those. Uh, gravity produces so much pressure in the interior that the core of the star is literally destroyed through a collapse. It's, it's, there's so much pressure that you are literally destroying the atoms that exist in the core, and the amount of energy that's produced in that process is enormous, and it causes the star to explode. It is a literal explosion. Um, I don't know how many times I can say the word literally here, but, uh, but uh, it's something that happens instantaneously. It's a catastrophic, sudden explosion of a star. Now, the picture that you see here is technically referred to as a supernova remnant. The supernova is the initial explosion that takes place, whereas the leftover kind of debris that we typically see is the remnant of the supernova. So um, we're going to be talking about these two different types of stellar deaths, and we're going to start with how it works for the sun. <clears throat> All right. So what we're going to do here is this. We're going to walk through um, <clears throat> all of the stages from when the fuel starts to run out on the main sequence into the giant stage and then eventually into the final stage of the star's life, which is the planetary nebula white dwarf. So let's go through that process now. At some point, the fusion reactions will slow down and eventually stop inside of a star. Now, the picture says a five solar mass red giant. Okay, well, this is really not very different than how the sun is going to evolve. So let's just, I'm just going to speak of this as if it's the sun's future death here. So the fusion eventually slows down and will stop. If you could look down into the core of our sun, you would see uh, a core at the very bottom that's made of helium. And it's an inert core. There's no fusion reactions taking place there. The sun doesn't have a high enough temperature for fusion to take place. So the helium just kind of sits there and really doesn't do much of anything. Well, that create that's a problem because there needs to be a balance that occurs inside of stars. You need to have uh, something pushing out to fight back against gravity. And if there's no fusion happening in that core, um, you know, there's not really going to be a balance there. So what's going to happen is uh, gravity is going to initially start to contract the core. Um, it's the core is going to get smaller and it's going to start to heat up because it's being compressed further by gravity. 
Um, temperatures in the entire region will start to go up. And in fact, temperatures are going to start to go up in a region that is just outside of the core. Uh, in a location where there wasn't previously fusion, so there is nuclear fuel there. When the temperature reaches the point for proton-proton chain reactions, then the star will sort of turn on again temporarily. There'll be a new, uh, uh, like a renewed life for the star, and uh, we will see that a shell of hydrogen fusion will start to occur around the core of the star. Again, this is a place where fusion did not previously exist. The temperatures weren't high enough in the past. But now, due to the fact that gravity is crushing this interior here, the temperatures are going up, now it is viable for fusion. And so if you think about the equilibrium here, you have gravity still pushing down, but now there are arrows that are pushing up that are much bigger than they previously were because there's fusion now here. And so because the arrows are bigger, uh, the gas pressure is going to uh, be able to uh, um, push back harder against gravity. So um, there's more support there, we say, than there's needed. And this causes the star to expand to a much larger size. Uh, it will cool off in the process because you're kind of distributing that energy over a much larger surface area that causes the star to cool off. And it will change spectral type. I mean, not only will it become a giant, but it probably, you know, like our sun's a G star, probably will evolve into some kind of K giant or something like that. But that's the initial uh, expansion to the red giant. And so, yeah, the star kind of comes alive again. And for a brief moment of time, there's a bunch of fusion taking place. And so the star will, uh, will continue on with fusion until that gets used up. Uh, just for a comparison of sizes here, uh, our sun is currently about uh, 700,000 kilometers in radius. Uh, Arcturus, as you see here, is a star that's actually really similar in mass to the sun. And in fact, it's uh, a star that's somewhat nearby to us. It's very easily visible in the night sky. But this is a star that has recently entered the giant stage and is definitely, you know, uh, a good example of what will happen to the sun uh, when it dies. So um, the giant stage for our sun, it probably will expand out at least initially to about 25 solar radii, which puts it about halfway to, to Mercury um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, distance to, uh, to the planets here. Uh, just for comparison, we have Antares on here. Antares is not a giant. It's a supergiant. This is a much higher mass star that will likely go supernova when it explodes. And uh, just for comparison there, those get a lot larger. Uh, you can see here that the supergiant uh, will expand beyond the orbit of Mars. So um, our Arcturus will continue to expand, actually, um, and will potentially get to about 100 times uh, the solar radius, which would put it basically right at Earth's orbit. So Mercury and Venus would be gone um, when the sun expands. And the Earth, well, the Earth will have some problems. We'll just say that. <laughs> It's possible the Earth gets pushed out a little bit due to like tidal forces, so I, it's not entirely sure that the Earth would be completely swallowed up by the sun, but clearly um, life as we know it would not exist with the sun being so close to us. So. All right, so what's um, <clears throat> what's the main, uh, sorry, what's the HR diagram look like for these objects? So um, for these objects, they have properties that um, uh, make them go up and to the right. On, uh, on the HR diagram. <clears throat> Some cases it's more up, like our sun. It goes more up, then it goes to the right. So if a star goes more up, that means there's a higher luminosity. And that means there's a lot more energy being produced inside of our sun than previously existed. Uh, that fusion shell <clears throat> is going to be providing a, a lot more um, energy than what previously existed. So it's uh, it's mostly up um, compared to going to the right. And then stars that are like, you know, 
three or five solar masses. We see their motions mostly to the right. So they're going to have a similar thing where they're going to get a fusion shell, but their fusion shell is going to be significantly, it's not going to be significantly different than what they uh, had to begin with. Um, so it's mostly an expansion and a cooling off, not really much more luminosity that occurs there. But that's where they're occupy. Um, this place that's up into the right where the giants are, that's the place they're going to occupy while they're doing this uh, hydrogen fusion shell um, reactions. Now, <clears throat> what's next? Well, you got hydrogen fusion shell burning taking place, and that creates even more helium. And the helium gets dumped onto the core, and the core actually gets larger and larger and larger. Um, in some of the most lowest mass stars, you know, the core really never gets hot enough to do anything other than proton-proton chain. So at some point, the fusion shell runs out, and that's it. Um, there's no more fusion left. For stars that are sort of like our sun, uh, what will happen is, you know, the fusion shells, you know, there'll be a, shell, a fusion shell burning, and then it will eventually run out. And it's possible that a compression occurs, and then a second shell actually gets ignited, and maybe even a third shell. Uh, but at some point... Um, you do run out of that stuff and then gravity starts to continue to contract the core and cause the temperature to go up. And for stars that are like the sun, it's uh, very likely that they will reach uh, temperatures that allow helium fusion to take place. And that's what we call the triple alpha process. We talked about that in a previous, I think last week we did. And uh, that creates a lot of carbon. Now, what happens here? is when this fusion starts, it's sort of instantaneous. Um, the core is highly compressed now by gravity. And so when the threshold for helium fusion starts, it's kind of like lighting a match. The entire core just kind of goes up in one huge fusion burst, basically. And so if you look back in the pictures here, you'll notice this part with the luminosity just soars, right? Just goes up almost two orders of magnitude here. That's the helium flash that's occurring. It's an enormous release of energy. <clears throat> um, not enough to rip the star apart, but enough to um, cause the star to expand to an even larger size. That's when a star like our sun will, um, you know, get to about the size of, a, of Earth's orbit. Now it's burning its helium, but, you know, that stops as well. Um, the helium flash only goes up to about two solar masses. Beyond two solar masses, usually the star gets hot enough that it can start doing helium fusion before it gets super dense, so there isn't a flash that takes place. That's why this picture back here, you don't see the big jump that occurs. There's a little jump, but that's just that's not due to a helium flash. It's just normal helium fusion taking place there. But that stops too. So stars like our sun... Yeah, maybe they get some helium fusion going and they're making a bunch of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, stuff like that. But that's it. It's over. No more fusions taking place there. There really isn't enough mass inside uh, sun-like stars to do anything really beyond the triple alpha process. So what happens then? Well, gravity continues to crush the core and the temperatures go up and up and up. Again, not enough for a new fusion to take place but enough to produce so much gas pressure that um, the arrows that point up in equilibrium are much larger than the gravity arrows pointing down. So the gas pressure is going to win here. <clears throat> and the star starts to shed. And what you are seeing in these pictures here, these are what are called wolf rayette stars. That's the name of two, two different people that study these objects, wolf and rayette. And uh, wolf rayette stars are giant stars that demonstrate an enormous amount of mass loss. So the picture on the right here, there's a nebula surrounding the star. That's the star shedding. Just layers and layers are being blown off by the extremely hot interior of these objects. On the left here, we see a star in Orion uh, also has an extreme mass loss happening uh, there. You can see a, like a bubble that surrounds the star and things are being pushed away. And so these are stars that are, I mean, these are probably, these are 
totally dead by now. I mean, there's no fusion happening anymore, and it's just the intense temperatures inside are just ripping the star apart from the inside out. And eventually, um, when enough layers are ejected into space, uh, you will eventually uh, expose the once core of that star. Uh, that's what you're seeing in the picture here. This is called the Helix Nebula. So this is a planetary nebula. The nebula that you see, what look, kind of looks like an looks like an eye, you know, um, really looks like an eye actually. And uh, that's all material that was once part of the interior of the star. And the dot at the very center of this is a fresh white dwarf. Um, and it is the once core of the star. The core is shut down. There's no fusion anymore, um, but that's what we're looking at here. And so these stars can eject, you know, more than half of their mass into space. Now, initially, these things are vibrant and they're bright and they're, they're really beautiful initially um, just because of the vibrant colors uh, due to all the different elements that were recently created inside of the star and it's still really hot so there's a lot of luminosity still but they don't last very long um you know maybe tens of thousands or upwards of a hundred thousand years is how long these things are going to exist for uh it's just the nebula will cool off and there will be no sign that there was anything here other than the white dwarf but you know the things are really faint and, and difficult to find and eventually all this material will mix back in with the interstellar medium and it will be part of a new star at some point in the future. Now, one thing that could be a little confusing about planetary nebulas is the name planetary nebula. Uh, you know, why is it called planetary nebula? It seems to have nothing to do with planets. Well, it's true. It has nothing to do with planets. But when the um, astronomers first discovered these objects, they had colors that resembled the colors of Uranus that was recently found, like when planetary nebulae were discovered was around the time that um, uh, Uranus was discovered. And um, and the person who discovered the planetary nebula said, well, this kind of looks like a planet, so let's call it a planetary nebula. And it wasn't until like over 100 years later that we realized that this has nothing to do with planets. It's just a nebula that kind of looks like a planet, and uh, but we're stuck with the name because we've been using it for 100 years. So, yeah, there we go. We got a bad name for something, and we can't change it. That's kind of a common theme with things in astronomy. There's a lot of things that we name something and then later we find out what it is and we're like, oops, that was a pretty bad name. But we've been using it for decades or centuries and so we're kind of stuck with this name. So um, that's the kind of the problem is we discover things and we don't know what they are until much, much later. So we've got to be sort of careful with names uh, because of that. But anyway, that's why the name Planetary Number exists here. Here's some examples, some really, really amazing examples. Uh, the one on the left is the Cat's Eye Nebula. It, I guess it looks like a cat's eye. I don't know. A cat's never looked at me um, long enough to let me see its eye, um, which is fine because me and cats don't get along. But, um, yeah, you're seeing different layers inside the star. If you look down near – oh, well, you see the white dwarf there. If you look down real close, you see a really vibrant, really bright bluish color – that was a layer that was just outside of the of the core there. And then as you get further out, they get a little fainter, a little more reddish in appearance. That's the hydrogen. There's a lot of hydrogen inside the star, so you'd see a lot of that red color. The one on the right is a similar thing. Um, yeah, it looks like a looks like a lion, if I had to say, right? It looks like the mane of the lion. Um, but this one here, white dwarfs at the center again. And you see a more vibrant uh, nebula close to the center and then something that's a little fainter and redder further out. Um, you typically see stages of planetary nebula. Um, and we actually see in different stages. And this is due to, um, you know, as you're kind of peeling layers off of the star, you start off with you know, with the first few layers coming off, it's a, it's a region of the star that's not incredibly hot and so the colors aren't as vibrant and the wind that's kind of blowing things off of the star is not quite as fast. But as you start getting closer and closer to the center of the star, you're starting to see regions that are hotter. And so you're going to see brighter stuff. You're going to see more colors from the emission of all these elements that are inside there 
you're going to see a faster wind um, blowing layers out. And so you typically see those stages. And the Ring Nebula here is we see stages. Looks very rainbowish, actually. It looks really rainbowish, but that's that's not a that's not a true rainbow effect. It's just the product of all the different filters used to capture the light here. We got bluish and greenish colors. That's a very typical of nitrogen and oxygen. And then as you get further away, we see again the more reddish colors, um, primarily from helium, hydrogen, stuff like that. So we're seeing the stages here, and then again the white dwarfs right down there. Okay, so. Um, you know, you see it on the H diagram. You know, the giants are up and to the right here, and then we got our white dwarfs down and to the left. And so, you know, one question you may be wondering here is, how do they get there? I mean, how do we go from being in the upper right down to the bottom left? Well, how do you think we're going to study that? Take a wild guess. The H R diagram. All right, H everything's H R diagram here. All right, so, oops. All right, <clears throat> now there's some questions you want to think about. We're going to take a giant star and we're going to peel it. Like imagine it's an onion. We're peeling layers off of an onion. What do you think its properties are going to look like if you do that? Imagine you take a giant star and you peel off a layer. Well, you're going to have an object now that is smaller, looks hotter, but... Not really any major difference in its brightness, actually. And as you peel more and more layers off, we see that your properties would change in such a way that the objects would move directly to the left on the HR diagram. Now, what does to the left mean? To the left means a hotter temperature, but not a different luminosity. That makes a ton of sense, right? As you're peeling layers off, you would look deeper in and you'd see higher temperatures, but you shouldn't see a change in luminosity. Remember, luminosity is like the engine of the star. There isn't any more or less fusion happening in these objects when you do this. In fact, as these stars start to shed, they don't really have any more fusion going on. They just have this residual heat from the fusion. So the luminosity is not really changing, so they go immediately to the left. And guess what? We look at these planetary nebula. We look at the very centers of them, and we get the luminosity and temperatures of what lies in the center, and they occupy a very odd location on the HR diagram. They occupy this location that is kind of up and to the left, but still below the main sequence. Like if you see this region here, it's not really a region we normally find things, but the nuclei of planetary nebula, these fresh white dwarfs, they're found there. And then so once they get out of the planetary nebula, what are they doing now? Well, they're just going to cool off. And so they have this, we call it a cooling track. It's a, it's a, it's the properties are going to change such that the objects are going to move down and to the right. Down and to the right. What's down to the right? Lower luminosity, lower temperatures. Okay. Now, the luminosity and temperatures are changing because the object is cooling down. It is losing energy. The heat is being radiated away. And it's just no different than if you take a piece of coal out of a fire and put it down on the concrete and you just watch that thing cool off. It gets fainter, it gets colder, right? Same thing. And eventually they will reach this region where we, where, where is the traditional white dwarfs are located. Uh, it doesn't take incredibly long. I mean, the temperatures of these white dwarfs when they initially get out are very hot, hundreds of thousands of Kelvin, but the initial cooling is very fast and they get down to like, you know, in the tens of thousands rather quickly. And uh, they'll hit the, uh, the white dwarf uh, area of the, main, of, of the HR diagram. And what do they do after that? Well, they spend the rest of eternity cooling off. And cool off is an exponential process. It's slower the longer it's going on. So the initial cooling is very quick, and then it gets slower and slower and slower and slower. And some of the coldest white dwarfs we found are just under 4,000 Kelvin. And... Colder means older. Colder means older. So, because that's all they do. They just cool off. All right. So those are, that's the end. That's it. Now the planetary nebula fades away. The white dwarfs left behind. And that's all there was of the star. Uh, like I said, the star can eject uh, over a half of its mass back into the interstellar medium. So while the star has died, a lot of its mass is going to be recycled. And it will become a new star. And that actually is an important theme galaxies that we'll get into later so all right so let's kind of recap here 
what happens to some of the lower mass stars, and then we'll end up we'll end this lecture with the uh, what the higher mass stars do. So stars that are like the sun, stars that are like the sun have a mass range of about 0.4 solar masses. So that's at the very bottom of the G types, and then all the way up to eight solar masses, which puts you into somewhere in the upper uh, A types, maybe a little bit into B. Um, the fate of these objects is a planetary nebula and a white dwarf. And for most of these objects, the white dwarf is a carbon oxygen white dwarf. Some of the very, very lowest mass uh, white dwarfs uh, maybe couldn't fuse their helium, so they're a helium white dwarf. So. But what, remember what happens there is um, eventually fusion in the core starts to stop, or it does stop completely, and then uh, a fusion shell ignites, the star expands to a giant stage, uh, at some point, helium burden is going to start taking place. Um, uh, but then that's the last fusion it can do. Sheds layers. Then it becomes a carbon oxygen white, white dwarf. Okay. Um, now, a star that's lower than 0.4 solar masses, these are the M stars and the K stars. Now, you might remember a long time ago when we talked about... Um, our sun's interior, we said that we had a core, a radiative zone, and a convection zone. And I had mentioned in that lecture, well, if you go down too low in mass, the structure actually changes. And what happens is you lose your radiative zone. If the mass is sufficiently small, then the conditions required to support the star against gravity don't necessitate a radiative zone. It's just core and convection. So that means these objects are going to have a very different fate to them. Um, if they're completely convective inside, that means they don't develop the helium core, which means they won't develop a fusion shell, which means they won't expand to become a giant. So they kind of skip that. And we think that... Uh, over time, just the entire mass of the star gets converted uh, from hydrogen into helium. And then when all the hydrogen's gone, it's just a big ball of helium left over, and that will become a helium white dwarf. Now, we, I said probably. I said likely a helium white dwarf. Why am I saying this? Well, don't we know? No, we don't know. <laughs> because these are K and M stars. And they have life expectancies that currently exceed the age of the universe. No K or M star should have died in the history of the universe. So we can't test this theory out because this event hasn't taken place for any of these objects. Uh, I think the closest we will get, I, I believe that some of the highest mass K stars start to die around 17 billion years. And we're currently at 13.8 billion years. So we need to wait a few more billions of years before we can see this take place. But we just think they just skip the giant stage and, and the planetary nebula stage. And then, they, and then at some point, as you get really far down the main sequence, the white dwarfs and the, and the lower main sequence just kind of blend together. Um, that's probably what happens. So, uh, yeah, that's the lowest mass stars. All right. Now the highest mass stars. We'll wrap this up with talking about what they do. Now, here's what's different about a massive star. O stars, B stars. You're greater than eight solar masses. What's happening here? Well, unlike the lower mass stars, they don't develop a fusion, sorry, a, uh, a helium core. Because when they make their helium, they immediately start to burn it and they make carbon out of it. And the carbon can be fused with helium elements to make neon and oxygen. The thing is, is that these stars are high enough in mass that their internal temperatures are sufficiently high to do all of the fusion reactions. And what happens is the stars hit the main sequence and they start burning their hydrogen. And when they in in start making enough helium, they start doing all the other fusion reactions. That's when they move and become a supergiant. Because the energy in the supergiants is enormous. And it causes their expansion to a very large size. So they don't live very long in the main sequence because very quickly they start doing all the other fusion reactions and boom, they're off. They're off the main sequence. They're in the supergiants now. 
everything is so fast for these objects, right? If you could see inside of the cores of these really massive stars, these super giants, you'll see this onion layer structure again. Uh, this is of different fusion. The outermost layer is a hydrogen fusion shell. It is. And then, but it makes the helium and the helium is dumped and there's a helium fusion shell, and then a carbon fusion shell, and then a neon fusion shell, and all the way down till you get to silicon. Now, silicon burns to iron. As soon as you start making the silicon, it gets burned into iron. And that process is like a day that enough silicon gets fused into iron and iron is a problem because you can't make energy with iron. You can't fuse things with iron and make energy. You can't break iron apart and make energy. It's the bottom of the fusion reactions in terms of what you can get out of them. And this is a problem. This is a problem. And the problem is, is that there is an enormous amount of gravity crushing this core and the iron has no pushback. It doesn't have any fusion. There's no energy to push back. And so gravity will put such an immense amount of pressure on the iron core that it destroys the iron atoms. A huge chunk of the iron atoms are literally destroyed. And that amount of energy is enough to completely obliterate the star. The star explodes in an explosion called a supernova. Now, supernovas are actually a really fascinating topic in astronomy for multiple reasons. I mean, we're going to talk a lot about supernovas when we get into um, talking about galaxies because supernovas, when they explode, they provide a very good means to determine distances. So that's a big deal. Um, understand the details of supernova explosions are really important because it's gravity uh, having an impact on atoms. Uh, inside of the star. And it's one of the rare instances in nature where gravity and quantum mechanics have to somehow come together and, you know, produce some kind of effect. And so, you know, in physics currently, those two worlds, gravity and quantum mechanics, don't get along. Like, they're, they're independent theories and, and we don't understand how they overlap. I mean, we assume that somehow they can explain the same things. It's just not clear how that is. Uh, the supernova explosions are, like I said, a place in nature where the two worlds do have to come together. So studying these explosions can reveal a lot about the nature of gravity and quantum mechanics and maybe how they're connected somehow. So it's a, it's a big topic, like I said, for a lot of reasons, lots and lots of reasons. Um, this is the Crab Nebula. Uh, it's called the Crab Nebula because... Um, I don't know why it's called the Crab Nebula. It doesn't look like a crab to me. I'm looking. I'm not not seeing a crab. I mean, maybe like a hermit crab, like the shell of a hermit crab. I don't know. I'm not seeing the crab. But whatever. We're just it's it's a name. We'll just go with the name Crab Nebula. This is a very famous supernova remnant. Um, this occurred in our galaxy, and it occurred, as far as we can tell, about a thousand years ago. Actually, we know almost the precise date when this occurred. It was a series of days in May in the year 1054. Um, we, we literally get it down to like a weekend uh, in, 1050, in 1054. Um, when this exploded, it was visible in the daytime sky. I mean, you, you got to realize like these supernovas release an enormous amount of energy for... Like, like the amount of energy released when the explosion takes place is comparable to the entire amount of energy that the sun makes over its 10 billion year lifespan. Like it's, it's an immense amount of energy. And it was such an immense amount of energy that even though this object is located about 4,000 light years away from us, it was visible in the daytime sky. It was a second sun. And um, pretty much every single culture that witnessed this event and took down records and the records survived to this day wrote about this event. So that's why we're able to really nail it down almost to like a precise weekend, just because we have so many records of civilizations viewing this, this, this supernova that took place. I mean, just imagine that happens today, you know, just, we have a, for like two weeks or three weeks, just a new star, but it's, it, it's a new sun. It's not even a star. It's just a new sun. It's like, so the sun sets and it's not really nighttime anymore because you got this other star still up there. 
wild stuff, right? Wild stuff. And it happened in the history of, uh, of humanity. So, And it will probably happen again if we live long enough, which we probably won't, but whatever. So what's going on with this Crab Nebula? Well, we see it expand in every year. This is the explosion. In fact, this is a, this is a series of images here. There's like a, a bluer image that's X-rays. And uh, there's a green filter here and a red filter here, just highlighting the different aspects of the uh, sort of the fireball from the explosion here. And um, now here's what's really wild about this. Uh, very famous example of a supernova remnant. Um, here's what's really kind of wild about this. So we saw this happen in 1054. Did the supernova explode in 1054? No, it did not. Because it's 4,000 light years away. So if it's 4,000 light years away, that means it occurred about 5,000 years ago. And we're seeing it only 1,000 years afterwards. If somebody was closer to this, they would see a more evolved nebula. If someone is more than 5,000 light years away from this, they don't see it. In fact, like 90% of our galaxy is more than 5,000 light years away from this. So 90% of our galaxy doesn't even know the star exploded. So it's pretty, pretty wild. All right. Um, another famous supernova was one that occurred in 1987. Um, this one was famous because it was the first time that we saw what we call the progenitor of the supernova. We mean we saw the original star before it exploded. The picture on the left is a picture taken in the 1950s, and it was, it was of a blue supergiant in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And then what happened is like, I think it was like February 1st of 87. It was like either February 1st, or like 2nd. It was like right at the beginning of the month. And we have these neutrino detectors set up all over the world. And we study neutrinos that come from the sun. And if we're lucky, we get like one or two counts like a day or something uh, from neutrinos from the sun. And then um, this event took place. And then these neutrino detectors, like they got like 10 counts in an hour. And they're like, whoa, something happened in space. And they triangulated all the different um, detections. And they realized it came from the Magellanic Cloud large Magellanic cloud, and then we point our telescopes there, and, and then boom, we see the explosion take place. That's a bit further away. It wasn't in our galaxy, so it wasn't as, as, an, it wasn't as bright uh, in apparent brightness. But it did provide confirmation to us that, yeah, this is what happens when massive stars explode. I mean, we had a pretty good idea that massive stars explode and create supernovas, but we kind of have to see a before and after picture, and this was the before and after picture, so it was a really big deal that we saw that. Um, I mentioned before <clears throat> that supernovas are going to be a really important part in this class. Uh, you can see in this picture here, there's a supernova going off in this galaxy. And if you look, the supernova itself, it kind of rivals the brightness of the core of this galaxy. The core of this galaxy contains easily uh, millions of stars. So the supernovas get incredibly bright. And they become really useful cosmic probes. And we use them to calculate vast distances in space. We can use them to actually identify galaxies that we otherwise can't see because they're the galaxies are either too faint or something's in the way or something like that. So you'll hear a lot more about supernovas uh, as we get into the galaxies later on. <clears throat> All right. So I kind of mentioned what's going to happen to our sun here. And um, let's go over it one more time. <laughs> so uh, fortunately, in our lifetimes, everything's going to be perfectly fine. Um, nothing's going to happen to our sun in the next hundred years or so, but um, you know, given about four or five billion years from now, the sun's gonna start to undergo changes. It's going to um, you know, have its fusion reactions slow down and eventually stop. It will initially expand to about halfway to Mercury's orbit when um, the hydrogen fusion shell ignites. It's gonna, it's gonna stay that way for a brief while and at some point, maybe it gets another fusion shell, but the fusion shells will stop eventually. And um, then the core will heat up and likely result in a helium flash. The sun will expand out to about the Earth's orbit. Um, Mercury and, and Venus, they're gone. They're gone. We might be gone. It's not clear. We might get pushed further out in the solar system, and then it still will be unpleasant. I mean, like, the entire Earth will just be charred. Um, there'll be no more liquid water here, and anything that's still alive somehow, five or four or five billion years later, 
I will be gone. Um, hopefully we figure stuff out by then. Like somehow by some miracle, we're alive billions of years from now. Like we'll probably move the earth, you know, we'll be nostalgic for our, for, our, for earth and we'll move it to a, a museum. <laughs> okay. So we won't be worried about the sun exploding. Then. Well, sun's not going to explode. The sun expanded. Right. All right. Anyway. So yeah, once the, uh, what's all the helium's done, eventually uh, the sun will start to shed layers planetary nebula will form like if somehow people are still on earth by then the sky will look amazing beautiful nebulas all over the sky and uh and then the sun will eventually become a carbon oxygen white dwarf and that is the eventual fate of our sun all right so um there's a little summary here of a lot of the uh um types uh, different types of uh, stellar evolution that we're talking about in the class here um so the next chapter we're going to be getting into one last topic on the death of stars, and that's this final question. <clears throat> okay, a star went supernova. Um, what next? What what when a star goes supernova, is anything left behind? And there is things left behind: neutron stars, black holes, and that's what the next chapter is going to be. I'll see you there.